All right, guys. So uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Chapter 2 today. We've got a couple more people that hopefully will join us and get in from there. Um, anybody have any questions pertaining to uh, last week, by any chance? No questions for, you know, stuff from last week? Okay. Um First thing I want to say, um, there were some people that submitted uh, more than uh, 10 of the review questions. Um, all I'm really asking for is just the first 10. Um, I know there's going to be 15, there's going to be 20, whatever the case may be. All I want is the first 10 questions submitted, so that makes it easier on you guys. Um, the other thing that I didn't mention is, even though the due dates on Canvas are going to say that um, it's due next week or two weeks, whatever the case may be, I'm extending it a little bit for you guys. Um, I know that people get um, tied up with work, things happen, um, I may be unavailable. So we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna split it up. So we're gonna have the first half of the semester and then we'll have the second half. So if you don't get assignments turned in, it's okay. Don't worry about it so much. Um, but we will, uh, I'll let you know what that date is as we approach, but just think of it as first half, second half semester. So the assignments will be due um, and you won't be penalized. Um, the other thing too is the student questionnaire assignment, it locked you guys out um, if you tried uh, submitting it and so there wasn't a way to submit it because it was saying it would have been late. I reopened that so the student questionnaire portion is available so you can get your uh, quick easy five points. Um, the other thing too, after reading a lot of these questionnaires, I did notice that a lot of people um, were really interested in the tech side of things, uh, which is cool. So I'm. I'm a tech myself. Um, I can definitely answer any more any of your technical questions that you guys have in regards to that field, especially when it comes to service and installation. Um, there's a lot that you guys can learn um, in that field once you sort of you know become a grunt. Initially, out of school, you're going to be a grunt. You're going to be picking up tools. You're going to be picking up parts. You're going to be doing all the stuff that nobody really wants to do. And same applies to 399. And as you pick up more and more information and knowledge and learn along the way, your positioning moves up. So you'll go from being um, that grunt to, um, all right, now I'm gonna start doing installs. So you're gonna be with somebody, you're gonna do AC installs, you're gonna do furnaces, that sort of thing. Um, mini splits, those are a big thing coming up. Uh, we'll definitely talk about some of those. Um, you know, and so that's pretty much what you're gonna really see on the service side. As you get a little bit, uh, more into the industry, you'll start repairing things and really um, diving into the nitty gritty. Um, the service side is gonna be a little bit more complex than what you're going to learn here at Moraine, um, but everything that you're gonna have is, especially through this class, is gonna be the basic understanding of the principles. You know, how does refrigeration work? Um, and once I understand that, then I'm able to use that knowledge to help me fix the equipment. So, um, $399, um, I know there was one or two people that were interested in doing that. Uh, $399, another good, solid opportunity uh, getting in there. Um, but with the $399, what's going to end up happening is you're going to work your way up the ladder, and um, you're not necessarily only going to be doing HVAC. You're also going to be doing things like painting, um, some plumbing stuff, building maintenance. Um, so that's a better title for 399 instead of just being like a stationary engineer. So, um, any questions up until this point? All right, if not, we will uh, start moving into today's chapter. Um, if I haven't mentioned, I will mention this class, it, it's a lot of dry material. Um, it's a lot of stuff that we have to cover and go over. Um, I'll try to make it as entertaining as I can, but there's only so much I can do. Um, so it, I, it's almost death by PowerPoint. Um, I'll try not to be boring, but like I said, just a lot of stuff that we have to cover over the course. Um, so let's go ahead and... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the other screen here. All right, so we're going to talk about chapter two and safety. 
So what is safety and how does that really play into the whole thing for us? Um, we're going to be working with electrical. We're going to be working with high pressures. We're going to be working with water. We're going to be working with a lot of dangerous things. We want to ensure that we're safe when we're doing this. Um, we're going to ensure that we meet uh, or know what OSHA stands for and its purpose. Um, we're going to know all the different hazards. Um, how do we go about safely working on all this stuff um, to ensure the, your well-being and safety? Um, we're going to talk about PPE, personal protective equipment, um, the safe practices when lifting, using a ladder, scaffold, all that fun stuff. Um, so we've got the uh, safety and government uh, standards. Um, the big company out there is OSHA, uh, Occupational Safety and Health Act. So basically what this organization does is they ensure that the workplace environment is safe, all right? Which means that we're gonna have uh, proper safety measures implemented for you to do the job. So if you need a ladder, you're gonna have a properly working ladder and you're gonna know how to use that ladder for that job. Um, if I have other things that I need, for example, if I'm going into a confined space, a confined space is, we'll say, a small little environment where I may get stuck in and I may need uh, additional air supply. What are the rules? What are the regulations for me to do that? And OSHA is the governing body that makes up all these rules. Um, there's different types of dangers out there. Those are considered hazards. Um, we want to ensure that we eliminate and minimize the hazards as much as we can. Um, OSHA, they provide you with the knowledge and the, um, the ability to properly work in a safe environment. Um, when you come up to a job site, you need to ensure that you know, is this going to be safe or not? So if, for example, I come up to a condensing system and it's underwater by three feet, I may not necessarily want to work on that. Why? Because there's electrical. And if electrical is in the water, we can potentially get electrocuted. So I'm going to evaluate every situation differently, and that's where your best judgment comes into play, and OSHA regulations. If something isn't safe, bring that up to your uh, supervisor. Um, see what kind of options are available. See what kind of protective equipment is available to help you along to make sure that you don't get hurt. So don't be these guys. So right there, I'm just going to stop really quick. That big flash that you wound up seeing, that's what's called an arc flash. Um, that's when there's a large surge of electricity jumping from one connection to the other. And in doing so, it releases a large amount of energy. And 
that arc literally blew up in that guy's face. So when this guy was turning on or working on that uh, system, he had luckily a face shield that prevented him from really getting hurt on that. stick theory he's gonna go flying across the try to kill the engine with water and hit the big stick Jesus Christ. okay now we're gonna smother it with a tarp and we now anger the machine the machine is now angry you dumbass this is hilarious okay we're gonna smother it with tarp it's actually gonna work i think oh there we go oh 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 right him in the hole oh right him cowboy in the hole still. Oh, Ole! Eight seconds, eight seconds. <laughs> he is now blinded and mad. Oh, this is This is going to be YouTube. <laughs> the film is rolling, Howard. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so basically what I just showed you there was just um, some videos, things like that, um, that really can make the job easier, but they're really not all that safe. Um, so when we do our jobs, we want to ensure that safety is the utmost importance. If you get injured, guess what? You can't work. If you can't work, you can't make money. Um, so let's just go ahead and make sure that we're doing things safely and properly. Um, the big thing is for us, electrical. Um, a lot of our equipment, it, actually all of our equipment has some form of electrical in it. Um, whether it's 120 volts, 220 volts, um, it can be 24 volts, it varies. Commercial side, we can do 480 volts. Um, a lot of dangers with that. You know, we can get shocked, we can get burned, there's explosions, electricians. Um, you know, just like I showed you in that video there a little bit ago, um, arc flashes, you know, those can be big thing, especially when you're working around really large voltages like the 480. Um, don't even be surprised, you know, around 120 volts, you can still get an arc. Um, the big thing that I've learned in the industry, and a lot of people, you know, should know this, is when you're even flipping a circuit breaker on an electrical panel, you've got a lot of voltage behind it. Sure, it only may be 100 or 220 volts in your panel, but you still still have a lot of amperage behind it. It's the amperage that's going to kill you. It's not necessarily voltage. So when you're flipping a circuit breaker, don't look at the circuit breaker. Turn your head to the side, flip that breaker, and then you can look at it. So in case it does arc out or something does happen to you, you're not going to be blinded. You may be injured, but you may not be blinded. Um, there was an instance, and I got lucky. Um, I was working on a forklift, uh, 36 volts forklift DC um, that's a lot of energy stored up in this thing it was a battery battery powered and I was going back and forth between disconnecting the battery connecting it for testing purposes well the one time I thought I had disconnected the battery I didn't 
and my finger touched something with metallic and I just had a huge arc flash in front of me. Um, luckily nothing happened. I got a little bit of a burn on my finger, but um, it definitely scared the living bejesus out of me. So um, even though you take certain precautions, you really have to be on top of your game, especially with electrical. Um, use grounded power tools in GFCI outlets. Um, the reason we use grounded tools is when we envision an electrical circuit, we have a goes into, which would be the hot wire. Out of there, or connected to the other side, is the goes out of. And so basically, electricity, if you can think of it, it's going to flow into the tool and then back out of the tool. But if for whatever reason that goes out of wire, the white wire is busted, well, now that tool is electrified. And if I put my hand on that, and I now all of a sudden become that neutral wire that goes out of, and guess what? I'm going to get electrocuted. So we have that ground wire on that tool to ensure that if there is an issue with that other wire, at least there's another way for the path for the electricity to dissipate and not to go through an individual. Um, GFCI, they're basically looking for a, uh, a short, um, especially around water. Uh, we want to ensure that we don't have electricity and water being very close to each other um, because electricity does flow through water very well. Um, when we're talking about um, being safe around electrical equipment, mechanical equipment, there's a system that's in place. It's called a lockout tagout. And the whole practice is we want to lock out a mechanism or an electrical switch in the open position, which basically means that whatever we're working on isn't going to get power. The reason we want this is in case I turn off a switch, I go work on a machine, somebody can't come behind me and turn that switch back on. Um, if that happens, <clears throat> I may get electrocuted, I may get my arm trapped, you know, I could potentially die depending on the type of machinery that I'm really working on. If I got my hand in the blower, you know, that could be really dangerous. So um, what we end up doing is we're going to go ahead, we're going to put a mechanical device on a switch. That mechanical device is going to prevent somebody from flipping that switch, turning it on. It could be a padlock, it could be um, a cover for the switch, numerous different types. Um, so now we're really restricting that um, device from operating. The next thing we're going to do, we're going to put a tag on there. We want to put the tag um, indicating who is working on the equipment and the date. The reason we do this is um, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to work on a piece of equipment, and maybe I need it tagged out for a day. But then for, something happens to me, and two weeks later, they're still wondering why this equipment isn't you know, working. Oh, well, this technician was here. He never removed it. Or they can contact me, ask me, hey, is it okay to uh, remove that tag? Whatever the case may be. Sure, yes, no, maybe. Well, we got that answer, or at least we know which direction to go to. So we want to ensure that we're locking and tagging out as much as possible. So this is a generic <clears throat> a lockout, tagout kit. Um, you may see some of these things around. You may not. It just depends on the application, where you're at, what you're working on. Um, so these are like little uh, class that go onto um, units. For example, if we have a disconnect switch, um, it's got a little lever on the side. You may see that. And what ends up happening is we can use one of these hasps and we can click, put that on there, and then we can take our padlock and put it through. Now, the nice thing is, is let's just say this is a large piece of machinery and we've got two or three people working on it. Well, guess what? We can put a padlock through each one of these different holes so each person gets its own section. So once you come in and you remove your padlock, great. Now we're just waiting for the other two individuals to remove theirs before we can fire up the machinery. And so this is great to use around multiple people. Um, this would actually be used on like wastegate valves, um, handles, things like that. So you can't turn that and handle. Um, so if you're working on different plumbing projects, uh, that's what you would use those for. Um, here we've got more or less like circuit breaker switches. Um, you can just screw those onto a circuit breaker, put your padlock through, you're safe. Um, little switches over here. Um, these can be used for different applications like plugs, that sort of thing. We can put that onto the end of a plug so that way people can't just plug 
in a piece of equipment and then here's our tags you know do not operate and you can write on there um, stating what the, the reasoning is who's doing it and the date so we also have fire hazards um, simplest thing we're working with fire when we're brazing um, we've got oxygen acetylene or air acetylene um, we need to make connections between copper how do we do that well we use a torch we use some um, uh, some uh, uh, I can't even think of it but uh, some elements that we melt um, to braze the joints and um, so we're constantly working around fire um, it may involve working with flammable or combustible material um, the first thing I will tell you guys when you are brazing in and around equipment, um, we want to make sure that there are no fire or smoke detectors around. Those smoke detectors are going to get triggered um, by the smoke and the um, uh, by the brazing process, I should say. And so we want to ensure that we're not going to set that off. We're going to make sure that there's no sprinkler heads in the area. If they are, we want to take pro uh, proactive measures. Um, we want to know how to use different fire extinguishers too. There's different fire extinguishers for different types of fires. We want to make sure that we're not using the wrong extinguisher on the wrong setting. So for example, if we use a corrosive agent on an electrical fire that's in a server cabinet, well, guess what? We may end up endangering and destroying all of that equipment. Um, whereas if we used a normal uh, or a dedicated extinguisher for that type of fire, we wouldn't have that extensive of a damage. Um, minimize fire hazards before starting a job. We're gonna remove all the wood, paper, different types of debris, insulation, anything that can really catch fire. Uh, we want that really out of the way to ensure that nothing does spontaneously combust. Sometimes we're limited on based on our locations and we can do the best we can. And there's a way to, to bypass that so that we're, we're not really catching things on fire. Uh, there's spray gels, there's uh, different types of <clears throat> heat absorbing uh, fabrics that you can put behind stuff so that way you're not going to cook things behind it. Um, we do have a little flame tip when we are brazing and we can control that as best we can by directing it. But if objects do get in the way, we have to sort of mitigate that as best we, as possible. Simplest way is just a little wet rag. You can wet a rag put that around something and usually that the uh, rag should dissipate the heat or absorb the heat and uh, keep whatever's underneath it um, from melting or combusting. Um, exercise caution when bracing or working or on or near burners. <clears throat> so here's some different types of fire extinguishers that um, we have. We've got the class A, B, C, and D and just be aware of what fire extinguisher you have. Um, so, like for example, uh, a dry chemical that's great to use on uh, magnesium, lithium, things like that. Um, but don't use a dry chemical on um, the other ones. So we got to ensure that we know what fire extinguisher we have and on what type of fires that we can use it. So when we use a fire extinguisher, we're going to use the pass method. So we're going to pull the pin, we're going to aim at the base of the fire, we're going to squeeze the handle and lever, and we're going to sweep from side to side. How to use a fire extinguisher. In this short video, we'll cover how to properly use a fire extinguisher using the PASS method. Now it's important to note that if a fire does occur in your workplace, that you follow these three important steps. Step one, once you've seen the fire, First, grab the closest fire extinguisher, ensuring it's the correct type and class appropriate to extinguish the fire, and always make sure to keep your back to an unobstructed exit. If you do not think that you can put out the fire safely, make sure to evacuate the building. Step 2. Once you have your fire extinguisher, stand 6 to 8 feet away from the fire. Step 3. Follow the PASS 4-step procedure. First is P for pull. Pulling the pin unlocks the operating lever and allows you to discharge the extinguisher. Next is A for aim. Make sure to aim the extinguisher nozzle or hose at the base of the fire. The first S is squeeze. Squeeze the lever. 
This discharges the extinguishing agent. Releasing the lever will stop the discharge. The second S is for sweep. While discharging the extinguisher, start moving towards the fire. Keep the extinguisher aimed at the base of the fire and sweep back and forth until the flames appear to be out. Once the fire has been extinguished, make sure to watch the fire area. If the fire reignites, repeat the process. Always remember that smoke generated from the fire can be harmful and even fatal. Never attempt to extinguish a fire unless it is safe to do so. Now to recap the PASS four-step procedure. P is for pull the pin. A is for aim the nozzle. The first S is for squeeze the lever. And the second S is for sweep. At Grand River Occupational Health and Safety, um, so that's just basically how to use a fire extinguisher. extinguisher. Um, towards the end, they showed you, you know, uh, the fire reigniting. Uh, what's going to happen is, depending on where you're at and what the procedures are, you may do a thing called a fire watch. Um, what ends up happening is, after you're done brazing, working with fire, you're going to stand there or sit there and just keep an eye on the area to ensure that nothing is going to ignite. Um, we're going to let that material cool off and we're going to ensure that nothing gets close to it that can really cause it to combust. Um, yeah, that guy should have watched the first video. All right, go for it. I'll probably make a big for it. And if your boss ain't watching, they can be fun toys, but don't say I showed you that. Um, <clears throat> when we're working too, um, we're going to have the outdoor elements that are going to play a factor. Um, also indoor elements. Um, you can be working on a rooftop and those temperatures can get 130, 140 plus degrees. You can be working in a freezer um, and you can be down into the zeros to the negatives. Um, so it really all depends on what environment you're working in, and we want to ensure that we have the right uh, clothing and protection for the environment. So we want to make sure that we dress properly for indoor and outdoor work. If that means, hey, I got to wear a parka, snowshoes, snow boots, uh, bibs, whatever the case may be, when it's uh, negative 20 out, well, so be it. That's what I got to do. I got to protect myself, um, avoiding injury um, outside. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go ahead, we're going to wear the type of clothing that is recommended first off by our, our boss, whether it's a uniform, we're going to try to wear as light a clothing as possible, we're going to try to wear hats, sunglasses, uh, things like that in the uh, summertime. Uh, we want to make sure that we're layering up. Uh, layering is good because we can always take stuff off and we can put it back on. Um, the reason being is in the wintertime we're trying to avoid sweating. That moisture, once it hits your skin and it stays there, it's going to start cooling you. And what's going to end up happening is you're going to really start getting cold. Um, so you want to be able to work without creating a sweat, especially in really cold environments. Um, wear waterproof boots um, in the cold in the winter. We're going to make sure that our feet are going to get frozen um, by wearing sneakers or anything like that. Uh, dress lightly. Drink plenty of water. Wear sunscreen in the heat of the sun. Um, the other thing too is you can drink tons and tons of water, but you have to make sure that you do have a little bit of sodium going in. Um, that's where Gatorades are nice. You don't want to just drink Gatorades all day long, but you may want to have you know a bunch of water with maybe one great Gatorade. What ends up happening is that salt inside um, helps your cells absorb that water 
if you were just to drink pure water, you're not gonna be able to hydrate yourself. That water's just gonna go straight out through you. So you need a little bit of sodium. Um, we wanna watch out for signs of heat-related illness and hypothermia. So uh, keep an eye out for yourself. Make sure that you don't start feeling dizzy, um, start getting a headache, that sort of thing. Um, take breaks, especially if you're working in really hot environments in attics. Attics are brutal uh, in the dead of uh, summer. Uh, whether you're putting up ductwork or insulation or whatever the case may be, fixing a unit, um, take frequent breaks. Um, you can really run into some serious health issues uh, working in an attic. Um, ducts, hydronic piping, and refrigerant tubing. tubing can be cold or hot hazards. Um, different types of tubing, I mean, on a typical refrigeration system, AC-wise, if we're talking about R22, our pressures are going to be anywhere from 60 PSI on the 60, 70, 80 PSI on the low side, all the way up to 200, 250 on the high side. If we start talking about R410A, which is the newer type of refrigerant, our pressures are going to start reaching 400 PSI. Um, if you're putting in a mini split, the manufacturer wants you to test the pressure of that system at 600 PSI. Um, PSI is pressures per square inch. And what that means is you've got 600 pounds of force on one inch uh, space. And that is very uh, high. Um, you can have an explosion. Um, you can have all kinds of issues uh, associated with that. If you start getting into really um, high refrigeration like ammonia, things like that, I think the pressures there are like 800 PSI plus. So um, there's a lot of things out there as far as uh, pressures go. Um, there's also uh, the temperatures. Um, temperatures are going to really drop on those. Um, steam is going to get really hot. The piping associated with that is going to be above boiling um, because we're turning water into steam. So that happens 210 degrees so you or whatever the case may be and um, we want to uh, ensure that we're not really touching that piping so um, first aid and burden kit should have supplies to treat burns and frostbite um, the other thing that you should have or be cognitive of is it's called a trauma kit a first aid kit is nice um, it's going to give you little band-aids, little boo-boos, medication, that sort of thing. But the problem with the trauma kit is, or not the, the first aid kit, it doesn't have anything in there for trauma-related stuff. Um, so my situation was I was a maintenance manager working at a company. And what wound up happening was uh, there was a guy, he got injured. I went to uh, see what was going on. All I saw was a guy laying on the ground grabbing his arm. I'm like, okay, a lot of blood uh, on the floor. Went to the first aid cabinet, opened it up, and there were just band-aids in there. You know, how do you really deal with a situation like that? Um, basically, what had happened was the guy put his arm where it didn't belong. It got cut off, and we had to um, give first aid response to him um, as best we could with the you know equipment that we had. Um, if I had a tourniquet, if I had, you know, large gauze, things like that, we would have been able to uh, help him a little bit better. Um, you know, so we want to ensure that we do have supplies based on what type of work environment we're working in. Um, so if we're talking about burns and frostbite, we want to ensure that we dress appropriately. Uh, if we're working on a roof, um, this probably isn't going to be acceptable but you may feel comfortable. So as we were talking about pressure hazards, um, refrigerant piping is going to have a lot of different um, levels of pressure depending on the type of refrigerant that you're working in. Um, also, the cylinders that we use to charge up our systems, those are pressurized, so we have to ensure that the cylinders themselves are taken care of properly, whether it's nitrogen or refrigerant. Um, all these different things have the potential to become uh, uh, a bomb, basically, in essence, or a missile. Um, if you were to take a nitrogen tank and you just shear it off the top, 
there's so much pressure in there that that nitrogen tank is going to turn into a missile and it's going to go through anything and everything in its way until that gas uh, frees itself. Um, so when we do work around tanks and we move them, we want to store the tanks as best we can to keep them from exploding. Uh, same thing with water heaters and boilers. Those can be uh, places for explosions uh, based off of pressure. Eye protection. Always, always, always wear eye protection. Um, you never know what you're going to run into uh, out in the field. And you may think that something is perfectly safe, and you may just all of a sudden um, have an unexpected injury. Um, I got lucky one day. I, uh, I had my glasses on, and I was working on a system. And the liquid line, um, the liquid line literally holds liquid refrigerant. And as I was working on the piping, closing off a valve, I had a stream of liquid refrigerant shooting towards my face. Um, luckily, it didn't hit me, but I can only imagine what would happen if I didn't have my glasses on. Um, that refrigerant was in excess of negative 40 degrees. Um, if that would have happened, um, guess what? I would have lost my eye instantaneously. So um, ensure that you wear glasses at all points in time. Um, there's some, you don't want to necessarily wear the cheapest ones that are out there. I mean, if that's what you have, that's what you have. Spend a couple bucks more, get something that's comfortable. If it's comfortable, you're going to be more inclined to wear it. So you don't have to go out there and spend a hundred bucks on some Oakleys, but you know, a good pair does go a long way. Um, when we're talking about uh, refrigerant cylinders, we want to make sure that we don't overfill them. Um, the reason being is if we overfill them, there is that potential for an explosion. Um, when we fill up refrigerants or cylinders, we fill them to an 80% capacity. So what we're doing is we're removing refrigerant out of a machine and putting it into an empty tank. We're going to fill that tank to 80% of its capacity. The 20% left inside there gives the refrigerant room for expansion. Um, if we leave that tank at 100% capacity, inside the back of our van and it's 120 degrees out that day, well, it may potentially cause that tank to explode. We don't want that to happen, so we're only going to fill it to 80% of capacity. Um, review the SDS for vessel contents. So the SDS is the safety data sheet. Every chemical, every uh, product, liquid, that sort of thing that you use has an SDS. Um, and what it tells you is all the information that you need. So if I were to get um, a type of chemical, WD-40, in my eyes, what is the procedure? If I, get, if I were to swallow WD-40, what's the procedure? Do you induce vomiting or don't you? Certain chemicals want you to do that, certain ones don't. Um, you know, maybe one says, eat a loaf of bread. Whatever the case may be, you follow those and, and you um, do the best you can. Every company should have an SDS. Um, I believe OSHA does mandate that they have SDSs. Um, you may sometimes hear it as an MSDS, but know that they're pretty much the same thing. Um, confined spaces, we talked about that earlier. Confined space would be like, for example, a sewer. Um, you take a manhole cover off, there's only enough room for one person to get down there. Well, that space isn't really open to um, the atmosphere so much, and so you may get different types of gases down there. Uh, you may not have enough oxygen, and guess what? You may potentially pass out and die. So there's, based on the company that you work for, there should be a protocol from, for working in confined spaces. You may have to wear a uh, breathing apparatus of some sort to really help you in there. And we want to ensure that we have a pressure relief device installed. What that does is you'll see them really on the side of water heaters. Um, it's sort of like a uh, little brass uh, 90 coming out of the side of it. It's got like a little jiggly handle on it. And what you can do is you can actually pull up on that handle and we're going to relieve some of the pressure in there. It's designed to relieve pressure off the system to keep it from exploding. So if we do have some type of mechanical failure, we at least have this pressure relief device to keep the pressure down so we don't have a uh, potential explosion. So other pressurized cylinders 
we have storage cylinders. Um, those are generally stored upright. Um, we want to transport them carefully. Uh, nitrogen is commonly used on bracing and leak testing. Um, nitrogen is very common. Uh, you're going to be using that day in and day out uh, along with refrigerants. So that's going to be something that you keep in your truck. Um, we want to make sure that oxygen is free of any oil. If we were to flow oxygen across certain oils, oxygen doesn't like that and it will cause an explosion. Um, there's even certain types of um, O-rings that you have to use with oxygen, otherwise um, it could potentially explode too. Oxygen is really volatile when it comes to that. Um, maintain safe working pressures with all gases used. Um, so here we've just got a picture of a regulator. Um, this regulator is telling you what the actual pressure is inside that cylinder. Um, generally, it's going to be about 3,000 PSI when you're fully charged, and as that pressure drops, you will see the little needle move accordingly. This is our working pressure. This is the pressure that we're going to set it to. So, for example, if I'm going to be leak testing a system, I'm going to set the dial to 150, and I'm going to let my refrigerant flow through here, or the nitrogen flow through here and flow into the system until it reaches 150. Pressure wants to equalize, so it's going to go from the tank into the system, and it's going to keep flowing until both the tank and this pressure regulator meet the desired pressure. So this is what I was talking about earlier when we're talking about pressure hazards. Sorry. Now imagine that tank in the back of your van. Nothing's going to really be stopping that. So the other thing I want to show you guys really quick here is the safety data sheet for Dawn, uh, dishwash, dishwashing liquid. You know, it's used to wash uh, ducks. Um, really safe chemical, um, but it's got an SDS. And in here, it's going to tell you the different hazards and the different types of warnings that it has. Um, so for example, here's a hazard statement. It causes eye irritation. Um, so if you do uh, have some issues with Dawn, you know, what do we do? Um, it'll tell you here in the response, uh, wash hand thoroughly. If in eyes, rinse cautiously with water for several mis minutes. Um, so every SDS is going to show you or have in different inf information based on what ends up happening. If swallowed, drink one or two glasses of water. Here are the different chemicals that really make up uh, done. So we got sulfuric acid in there. Okay. Um, first aid measures, eye contact, skin contact, ingestion, inhalation. Um, it's really a safe product overall, but you know there are certain things that um, we want to ensure that we do in case something does happen. Um, so, so that's it. Um, you can look up any chemical out there um, based on or for their SDS. Refrigerants and their hazards. Uh, refrigerants can be flammable and they can be toxic. Uh, refrigerant vapor may be heavier than air. Um, so if you are in an environment where the refrigerant starts to leak out, especially large systems in a contained room, get out of that room. Um, you're going to displace the oxygen in that room from that uh, refrigerant and you're not going to be able to have any uh, way to breathe in there. Um, make sure you have proper ventilation to avoid asphyxiation. Uh, and then you can use refrigerant detectors. Some larger facilities will have refrigerant detectors in the space to ensure that if there is a leak, um, people are aware of it. So we have different types of classifications based on refrigerant. So we have the Class A, the Class B, Class 1, 2, and 3. Um, right now, 
R22 and R410A. Those are the refrigerants we use on the residential side. They're really not flammable. Um, so that's a good thing. The problem is, as we're moving forward, um, people want to get more environmentally friendly. R22 is actually not great for the environment. That's why we've switched over to 410A. 410A is still a greenhouse gas. And because of that, um, we're switching over to different uh, types of refrigerant. Some of them are like a uh, propane, you know, that sort of thing, where there is a potential for flammability. So be aware that over the course of the next few years, as these changes are coming, the equipment that you're using, your different types of uh, refrigeration equipment, uh, meaning vacuum pumps and um, recovery machines, that sort of thing, those will have to be upgraded or changed over to ensure that they're flammable uh, or capable of dealing with these flammable refrigerants. Um, nothing to worry about now, but know that it's really coming. Chemical hazards, uh, chemical use for cleaning, lubricant, water treatment, leak detection. Uh, there's all kinds of things out there uh, that you'll be using. You know, just be aware of them. Uh, the one of the most popular ones is a coil cleaner. It's sort of like an acid. Um, that acid, if it does get on your skin, it will start to burn. So make sure you wear gloves to prevent that from happening. Uh, wash diligently with water. Um, review your product, SDS, to know what the exposure and inhalation risks are. Uh, use appropriate PPE and prepare for any recommended first aid treatments. Um, your uh, employer may go over certain things of the, you know, with, of the SDS with you. They may not. It's up to you to really um, dive in and figure out what chemicals are dangerous and how to work with them properly. Uh, some chemicals can't be mixed with others, and the SDS may say that inside there. So um, just be aware um, that it's also your responsibility to ensure that you know we're doing things safely. So then we also have the GHS, which is a standardized system for labeling chemicals using symbols, signals, words, and hazard statements. Usually you're going to see pictures on there, um, like the poison symbol um, and, and so forth. All these really help explain you know, what type of um, chemical you're really dig dealing with and the hazards really associated with it. Breathing hazards. Uh, we want to avoid refrigerant, um, dust, asbestos, adhesives, and solvents. Um, all that stuff can get into our lungs, contaminate our lungs, and you know, potentially hurt us. So we want to make sure that we're working in an environment where we do have a lot of air circulating around us, um, that if the chemicals or anything else don't become too overpowering. Um, we're going to keep that exposure limit as much as we can. Wear respirators, wear um, things to really keep all the dust and stuff out. Um, use a ventilation system with a HEPA filter for asbestos work. Um, I don't know if anybody's going to really be working around asbestos, um, but if you do, there's different uh, types of equipment that you need to wear to ensure that you're not going to really get it on, uh, get it into your lungs and have some issues with it later. So PPE is our personal protective equipment. It's worn to minimize exposure to health and physical hazards. Um, so it can be something as simple as a hard hat, safety glasses, ear protection, uh, steel toe boots, anything else that you know is required while you're on the job. <clears throat> Most uh, companies are going to probably have you uh, wear safety glasses, uh, definitely hearing, hearing protection, um, boots, you know, may, they may or may not want you to have some type of safety toe, uh, whether it's a steel toe or a composite toe, that's for you guys to decide, um, but they may want uh, some type of protection for, uh, you know, fall hazards, keep your toes nice and safe. Um, we always want to ensure that we're wearing our PPE when we're working around everything. Um, like I said, we want to avoid any long-term injuries because if we do, then guess what? We're not getting paid. Here's a picture of a respirator. 
Um, with COVID going on, I'm sure you guys have seen all types of different face masks and coverings. Um, when we're working with chemicals, especially vapors, we want to use this type of a uh, breathing apparatus to keep things from coming in. Um, those N95 masks, those are going to be great for dust, but they're not going to keep the vapors out. We want these types of cartridges that are designed for keeping different types of uh, vapors from really uh, entering in. Um, it's going to stop the dust. It's going to stop the vapor. It's going to keep you uh, from potentially getting uh, injured. Sometimes we may need a supplied air respirator. And basically, <clears throat> that's just going to give you oxygen uh, while you're working uh, to make sure that you're really, um, like for example, if you're in a confined environment, you may need supplemental oxygen because there is not enough oxygen in the space. Um, I can't just take this respirator and put them on and go into a confined space. The reason being is there just isn't enough oxygen down there to begin with. I need oxygen brought in. So they may have those uh, yellow hoses that you see sometimes the construction guys wearing um, or using when they're working in the manholes. Um, that's one way of supplying uh, oxygen to them but just don't think that I can wear this respirator and be okay. Uh, protective clothing. There's different types of gloves for different work. Uh, a leather, aluminized, synthetic, fabric, coated, chemical. Um, the most common type of glove that you're gonna really run into nowadays is just like simple nitrile uh, gloves, uh, disposable type. Those are really great when you're working around oil grease. Um, nasty things that you really have to handle. Um, you just, you know, when you're done, roll them up, toss them out. Um, Raven makes a fantastic pair of nitro gloves. Uh, you can get those at AutoZone. Um, probably some of the best ones that i found. They're a little bit pricier, but they're definitely worth it. Uh, some of the cheaper nitro gloves out there, disposable ones, um, they'll just tear on anything. Uh, so if you're buying your own gloves, get those. Uh, they're really nice and heavy duty. The other um, gloves that I recommend for you guys, especially when you're going to be working around refrigerants, is a nitrile coated. So it's a fabric type of glove and then the hands or the palms are dipped in uh, uh, nitrile. And what ends up happening is, is when I'm working with refrigerant, disconnecting my hoses or connecting my hoses, the glove doesn't turn into a solid block because the refrigerant coming out of there is going to be really cold, negative 40 degrees plus, and as soon as that hits your glove, it wants to freeze whatever's there. So you still get a little bit of dexterity with this type of glove to keep the uh, keep taking the hose off without really having it freeze. If I were to use leather, leather would turn into an ice break and then I wouldn't be able to get my entire hose off. So nitrile uh, dipped gloves are really great. Um, work boots should be non-conductive and have heat resistant soles or a composite steel or toe. Um, since we are working with electrical, we want to make sure that um, the boots are electrical rated and that's just another form of safety. If I were to touch, um, say, a hot wire and that pathway is going through me and it's trying to get to ground, well, guess what? I've got rubber that I'm standing on which is a great insulator and it's not going to prevent the um, electricity from reaching ground, which isn't going to complete the circuit where I'm not going to get electrocuted. So we just have a couple of pictures of different types of gloves. Um, these almost look just like regular uh, dishwashing gloves. If you show up to work with those, um, you'll probably get laughed at. So um, don't wear these unless you're really going to be washing dishes or open some heavy duty chemicals. Um, over here almost looks like we got some uh, welding gloves, some nice heavy duty ones. Safe work practices, lifting. Um, off to the right here we've just got a uh, guy wearing a nice harness with fall protection. Um, if you're going to be working up in an uh, environment that may cause you to fall, definitely wear a harness. Um, it takes a couple of seconds to put it on. There are different types of mechanisms that attach to your back um, that allow you to still work, but if something were to happen, you're still going to be safe. Um, lifting, uh, let's use a hand truck, a dolly, and make sure that you're using the uh, proper methods. Ladder scaffolding, uh, they should be in good condition, set up safely, and used properly. 
don't use that top rung. Um, it's great to put your screwdrivers in, things like that, but don't step on it. Uh, you can lose your balance very quickly off of that. And we just talked about the uh, fall protection. You need to lift something. Let's say that something is about a third of your body weight or less, up to 51 pounds. Moving it properly is easy. Simply bend at the knees, grab that something, and lift using your leg muscles. Oops, keep it close to your body. There you go. Nicely done. Upright back, close to your body, use your legs, all excellent rules of thumb. But there are other factors to consider. These include the awkwardness of the lift, the height you'll be lifting, the distance you move the object, the frequency or repetition of the lift. In each of these cases, you should figure that you'll be able to safely lift less weight and consider other options. For example, let's say you have to lift more weight or lift it through a greater distance. You should not attempt the lift by yourself. Ouch! Instead, use a hand truck like this or flag down a co-worker like this. Good work. Or what if the lift is to the left or right of you? Even if it's fairly light in weight, twisting your spine during a lift can hurt your back. So turn toward the object nice and square. Very good. Then lift straight up. Now pivot your entire body and move the object. You're getting good at this. Here are a few more things to remember when preparing to lift. Organize storage to promote safe lifting by keeping heavy, awkward items in the power zone between shoulder and knee height. Stretch before lifting to get your muscles ready. Ensure you have solid footing and are wearing non-slip shoes. Plan your route to avoid tripping. Test the weight to be sure you can handle it alone. By lifting properly, you avoid pulling a muscle, straining your neck, or rupturing a disc in your back, which means you stay on the job, earning your full pay. Lifting right feels good, doesn't it? For tip sheets on lifting and the lifting quiz, click the link on your screen. So, just a little video on, you know, how to properly lift items. We want to ensure that we're going to maintain our uh, safety and not get injured while lifting something a little too heavy. Uh, confined spaces, an area closed off from a larger space, but large enough for a person to enter and perform. Like I said, uh, sewers, manholes, things like that, um, limited by airflow. Hand and power tools, uh, make sure that they're always in good condition. Uh, we want to ensure that if it does have that ground, but that ground's broken off, Let's go ahead, let's fix that. Um, Home Depot, Menards, Lowe's, they all sell little uh, plug replacements that come with the ground. So you can just easily cut the wire, splice that in, and uh, be all set to go. Um, use all tools properly. Don't use the wrong tool. Um, if you don't have the right tool, either go purchase one, borrow one, let your boss know. Um, you know, if that's the case, be mindful of electrical grounds and GFCI, GFCI outlets. Oh, let's see, there should have been a video there. There we go. Confined spaces, permit or non-permit? What is a confined space? And what's the difference between a permit and a non-permit confined space? Workers may encounter a variety of confined spaces on a work site, which may contain different hazards. Confined spaces. A confined space isn't designed for occupation by people, but it's large enough for a person to get inside and work. These spaces have limited or restricted means of entry or exit. Common confined spaces include tanks, silos, storage bins, vaults, pits, manholes, tunnels, ductwork, pipelines, permit space. A permit required confined space has one or more of these characteristics contains or has the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere, contains material that might engulf an entrant, walls or floors converging inward or downward to a smaller area that could trap or asphyxiate the entrant, contains another hazard, such as unguarded machinery, exposed live wires, or heat stress. Non-permit confined space. A non-permit confined space is a confined space that doesn't contain any hazard capable of causing death or serious physical harm. It also doesn't have the potential to contain serious atmospheric hazards. 
Permit confined space requirements. Permit spaces must be labeled with warning signs and access should be limited to authorized entrance only. Employers must develop a permit space program if employees must enter a permit confined space. This program includes hazard assessment, atmospheric testing, hazard controls, acceptable entry conditions, proper worker training, PPE and barriers, attendants stationed outside during entry operations, entry supervisors, emergency and rescue procedures. Confined space entry training. Before work begins, employers must provide training for workers required to work in permit required confined spaces. Authorized entrants must know the hazards, such as inhalation or dermal absorption, and how to use protective equipment properly. OSHAcampus.com has the crucial confined space training necessary to prepare workers and keep them safe. All right, so just a little more information on confined spaces and what they are. Uh, first aid kits, talked about that a little bit. Um, always know where they're at. Um, make sure that they're stocked up. If they're not stocked up, uh, let your boss know um, so that way they can refill it. Uh, usually they have outsourced that to a company. They come in weekly or whatever and fill it all up. Um, there's different types of courses, um, safety certifications out there. Uh, depending on who you work for, they may want you to get different uh, safety certifications um, just to be able to work on things properly. So that uh, concludes the PowerPoint uh, for today. So any questions on anything we covered today? So I'll uh, hang out for a few more minutes. Uh, if you guys want um, to really ask me anything, uh, whatever the case may be, for next week, uh, we're going to be covering the uh, next chapter, chapter three. So we're going to be doing the uh, chapter review questions at the end of it. Um, now there's uh, also a uh, chapter two quiz that's available. I did see some of the people have taken that already. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and feel free, you can take that. Um, know that you're allowed to take it twice. Um, however, it's only going to keep the score from your last uh, quiz. So if you think you did really poorly on the first one, then you can try to take it again, you can do that. So um, it is a timed quiz, so just be aware of that as well. So, all right, um, if nobody has any questions, like I said, I'll uh, hang out for a little bit, see if somebody has something. Otherwise, I will see you guys next week at the same time. Yes, sir. See you next time. All right. See ya. See ya. It's okay. <laughs> for me. <laughs> um, I actually had a question. Yes, sir. With OSHA, do they do like random spot check spot checks when you go on at sites or no? When with OSHA, they're such a large government agency. Um, the only time they're going to really get involved if there's like a work accident. Um, so, for example, if you were to get hurt on the job site, OSHA is going to come in and determine exactly what happened. Um, and we're talking about like a larger type of accident. I mean, if you get a little boo-boo and you cut your finger and you need a Band-Aid, that's not really going to be that big of an issue. But if, for example, there's an explosion, a fire, um, larger things like that, OSHA can get involved. Um, the other thing you can do too is if you feel like you're working in an environment that isn't uh, meeting OSHA standards, you can call OSHA and OSHA will come in and investigate and see exactly what's going on. Um, you know, that's, they're there for you as the worker to make sure that things are done properly. And I was just curious, my dad works at Walsh, but I hear him talk about that stuff a lot. So I was just seeing from like the HVAC side of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they can be a real big pain, um, especially to deal with because there's extensive fines out there depending on the um, nature of it. Um, you know, for example, if you're um, really negligent on certain things and not providing your uh, employees with PPEs and people start getting sick, oh, absolutely, they will come down hard on individuals. Um, has your father had any instances with OSHA? 
Um, I don't believe so. He does more of the uh, trucking stuff with Walsh, but still, okay. I was just curious from that end. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and they cover such a wide variety um, when it comes to safety. Um, it's really hard to say exactly what everything is. I mean, I know the ins and outs from the industrial side, but then they cover so much more. So, um, yeah, it, it can get really tricky. So depending on what you're working on, ensure that, uh, you know, if you have questions or you think something's a little bit sketchy, um, ask your employer about that. If not, you can go off, do your research, maybe even contact them directly to see what the uh, rules and statutes are. Uh, that's it. So I'll see you next week. Okay, take care.